William Gilly, uh, Hopkins Marine Station, Cannery Row, Chapter 25. Certainly all of the row and probably all of Monterey felt that a change had come. It's all right not to believe in luck and omens. Nobody believes in them. But it doesn't do any good to take chances with them and no one takes chances. Cannery Row, like every place, is not superstitious but will not walk under a ladder or open umbrella in the house. Doc was a pure scientist and incapable of superstition. And yet when he came in late one night and found a line of white flowers across the door sill, he had a bad time of it. But most people in Cannery Row simply do not believe in such things and they live by them. There was no doubt in Mac's mind that a dark cloud had hung on the palace flop house. He had analyzed the abortive party and found that a misfortune had crept into every crevice and that bad luck had come up like hives in the evening. And once you got into a routine like that, the best thing to do was just go to bed until it was over. You couldn't buck it. Not that Mac was superstitious. Now a kind of gladness began to penetrate into the row and to spread out from there. Doc was almost supernaturally successful with a series of lady visitors. He didn't even half try. The party, the puppy at the palace was growing like a pole bean and having a thousand generations of training behind her, she began to train herself. She got disgusted with wetting on the floor and took to going outside. It was obvious that Darling was going to, be, going to grow up to be a good and charming dog and she had developed no chorea from her distemper. The benignant influence crept like gas through the row. It got as far as Herman's hamburger stand, it spread to the San Carlos Hotel. Jimmy Bruccia felt it and Johnny had, and Johnny is singing bartender. Sparky and Nia felt it and joyously joined battle with three new out of town cops. It even got as far as the county jail in Salinas where Gay, who had lived a good life by letting the sheriff beat him at checkers, suddenly grew cocky and never lost another game. He lost his privileges that way, but he felt the whole man again. The sea lions felt it, and their barking took on a tone and a cadence that would have gladdened the heart of St. Francis. Little girls studying their catechism suddenly looked up and giggled for no reason at all. Perhaps some electrical finder could have been developed so delicate that it could have located the source of all this spreading joy and fortune, and triangulation might possibly have located it in the palace flop house and grill. Certainly the palace was lousy with it, Mac and the boys were charged. Jones was seen to leap from the chair only to do a quick tap dance and then sit down again. Hazel smiled vaguely at nothing at all. The joy was so general and so suffused that Mac had a hard time keeping it centered and aimed at its objective. Eddie, who had worked at La Ida, felt pretty regularly was accumulating a cellar of some promise. He no longer added beer to the whining jug it gave a flat taste to the mixture, he said. Sam Malloy had planted morning glories to grow over the boiler. He had put out a little awning and under it, he and his wife would often sit in the evening. She was crocheting a bedspread. The joy even got into the bear flag. Business was good. Phyllis's May's leg was heat knitting nicely and she was nearly ready to go to work again. Eva Flanagan got back from East St. Louis, very glad to be back. It had been hot in East St. Louis and it hadn't been as fine as she remembered it. But then she had been younger when she had so much fun there. The knowledge or conviction about the party for Doc was no sudden thing. It did not burst out full blown. People knew about it, but let it out grow gradually like a pupa in the cocoons of their imaginations. Mac was realistic about it. Last time we forced her, he told the boys, you can't never give a good party that way. You gotta let her creep up on you. Well, what's it going to be? Jones asked impatiently. I don't know, said Mac. It's gonna be a surprise party, Hazel asked. It ought to, that's the best kind, said Mac. Darling brought him a tennis ball and, and he found that he had thrown it out the door and into the weeds. She bounced away after him. Hazel said, if we knew when Doc's birthday was, we could give him a birthday party. Mac's mouth was open. Hazel constantly surprised him. By God, Hazel, you got something, he cried. Yes, sir. If, if it was birthday, there'd be presents. That's just the thing. And we got to find out when it is. That ought to be easy, said Huey. Why don't we just go ask him? Hell, said Mac. Then he'd catch on. 
You ask a guy when his birthday, and especially if you've already given him a party like we've done, and he'll know what you want to, want to know for. Maybe I'll just go over and smell around a bit and not let on. I'll go with you, said Hazel. No, no, if two of us went, he might figure we were up to something. Well, hell, it was my idea, said Hazel. I know, said Mac, and when it comes off, why, I'll tell Doc it was your idea. But I think I better go alone. How is he? Friendly, Eddie asked. Sure, he's all right. 